parts in this talk. So I'm going to be looking at the traditional boundaries of linguistic landscape research. I am then going to give you some uh, background in uh, translanguaging as a practical theory of language. And then I'm going to introduce some of the data um, to illustrate my point um, where I argue that the notion of sensecapes uh, might really help us uh, push things forward, not only for us translanguaging scholars, but also for people uh, who are interested in linguistic landscapes uh, from a more general uh, point of view. Um, so let's begin by having a quick look to an excerpt, uh, excerpt from uh, my field notes. During uh, my field work, let me move this around a little bit. Uh, during uh, field work around the city of Nador in northern Morocco, I interviewed two sisters, Nora and Lili. As they took me around an old marketplace, I was interested in the linguistic landscape of the market and wanted to have their perspectives since they had been visiting the market regularly since they were little girls. After about an hour walking around and talking about Arabic, French, Spanish, and Amazic or Tamazic, um, and the representation and use around the market, we crossed uh, the road to go into a small grocery store. And as we crossed the road, Lilia reached over and picked up a strawberry from a stall. Uh, she took a bite and said, this is the language, the most important language of the market. It hasn't changed ever since we were little and we used to come over with our grandfather. Now, uh, this idea of conceptualizing a lenguaje del mercado in, in connection with uh, what she experienced uh, through the senses and through uh, her own memory is at the very core of the proposal I'm going to be uh, developing today. Um, Linguistic landscape research, I believe, would benefit very much from expanding its current boundaries to include how people actually make sense of and within specific geopolitical areas, spatial units and physical sites through their senses beyond vision and through practices that go beyond those reflecting languages named after nation states. Now, let me begin by revisiting what we could consider the traditional boundaries of linguistic landscapes research. As a field, uh, linguistic landscapes typically focuses on uh, the visibility and salience of languages on public and commercial signs around a specific territory. It uh, focuses on written, uh, publicly displayed language and sits somewhere at the junction between sociolinguistics, sociology, social psychology, geography and media studies. And it, this continues to, um, to, to broaden, this spectrum continues to broaden. It's, it's a highly interdisciplinary, actually transdisciplinary endeavor. Um, the linguistic landscape is the language that we see in the public road signs, um, on advertising billboards, street names, place names, and so on and so forth of a specific territory or urban agglomeration, right? Um, moreover, it reflects the relative power and status of the different languages in a specific sociolinguistic uh, context. Um, it is an additional source of information uh, um, beyond census, beyond interviews um, and surveys around this um, specific area. And it contributes to the construction of the sociolinguistic context because people uh, process the visual information that comes uh, to them. Now, the linguistic landscapes paradigm uh, has evolved very rapidly, even though about 11 years ago, we still thought that there was no clear uh, theoretical uh, core. And I believe um, as more and more uh, research in linguistic landscape and, and venues such as the uh, uh, Journal of Linguistic Landscape, um, they have begun to, uh, to appear, uh, we're coming to a, a bit of an agreement on some, some issues, but we still remain open. Now, some examples of, of important work that happened on linguistic, la linguistic landscape uh, took place in places like Israel, the Basque Country, uh, Friesland, uh, Bangkok, and Tokyo. These are, if you are not uh, still uh, very familiar with linguistic landscapes research and you, you want to get the ball rolling, uh, these two are probably um, the go-to books, as well as um, uh, this, this book by um, Senos and, uh, and uh, Gorta. 
Now, besides just uh, the languages that appear on signs, we can also consider an aesthetic and sort of cosmopolitan dimension to the linguistic landscape. Some signs are actually not meant to be understood so much as to appeal to readers via a more prestigious language. Um, we also know that sometimes the linguistic landscape is um, um, in, uh, the, the, the script is somehow manipulated in order to become uh, aestheticized and look uh, more oriental, more exotic in some sort, in, in, in some way, or to reclaim a past. As it happened in the uh, Arab quarter of Granada in uh, Lehman and Melvin's study. Now, um, it's safe to say that so far we've, we've had a logocentric visual perspective in linguistic landscape research, bounded by written words that people can read with their eyes. Um, and this is normal, actually, because we have inherited this idea that uh, the, the, the sight, our sight, is the higher sense in, in our era, Eurocentric traditions. And uh, this is typically what we would consider a piece of linguistic landscape. Now enters uh, multi-modality, as Yanis uh, has wonderfully been talking about in the previous uh, talk. And we begin to think about language in, te in texts um, connected with a variety of other devices, other semiotic devices. And these uh, different semiotic and linguistic resources actually play a very important uh, role and facilitate the negotiation of uh, ideologies, discourses, and, and, and so on and so forth in specific contexts. Um, recently, relatively recently, there's been a call in uh, linguistic landscape research uh, to, uh, for it to become a broader uh, concept than just documentation of signs and um, to incorporate multimodal uh, theories to include sounds, images, graffiti, uh, the material, um, uh, the, the signs are made off. And this understanding incorporates, of course, the non-visual along the, the visual, right? So uh, linguistic landscapes through the, this perspective should not just um, um, include occurrences of the more obviously linguistic um, um, aspects, but also the people, the buildings, the sounds, other contextual domains, right? The, the notion of linguistic uh, 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 is expanded to potentially include all semiotic resources. Now, um, is this, a question or a dare to move from linguistic landscape to semiotic landscapes? Well, some people have taken it as a dare. Actually, a very innovative example of, of work under the notion of semiotic landscape research comes from um, Emmy uh, Suji and uh, Alastair Pennicock. Um, in Sydney, they look at um, a very multicultural uh, suburb. And as they uh, walked into a shop, they suddenly realized that there are newspapers spread across the floor. They, uh, they sense the smell of spices. They see the pots. They see the pans, cosmetics, DVDs uh, of films. And, uh, and they, they uh, decided to call uh, their, um, their, their study making scent of the landscape, incorporating this idea of smell into, into the, the notion of linguistic landscape, right? Um, now, different uh, smells um, affect um, or connect with, uh, with other resources. Uh, they, they affect the olfactory uh, maps of cities, right? And uh, Apadurai's uh, uh, proposal of very different landscapes or scapes uh, helps us really um, um, have some sort of framework. He uh, talks about ethnoscapes, mediascapes, uh, technoscapes, financescapes, and idioscapes, right? Um, the notion of sensory landscapes may therefore add an olfactory um, um, mode or aspect. Um, uh, uh, Pennycook and Otsugi uh, talk about smellscape. Um, Sensecapes as a concept is what I am interested in. And I'm interested in sensecapes because it helps me not only talk about or in, include smells, but include um, the other senses that we use when we uh, interact and when we experience our immediate surroundings, our immediate um, uh, landscape. Um, this idea was initially developed in a museum context. 
um, senscapes uh, refer to the experience uh, of the environment and of the other persons and things which inhabit the environment and how uh, this uh, experience is produced by particular modes of distinguishing, valuing and combining the different senses in, a, in, in the culture under study. House is an, is an anthropologist, so it's interested in um, um, different uh, cultures. Right, uh, the interaction between the individual and the landscape, as I see it, bears on the individual's subjective affordances at the time the interaction takes place. In other words, the way I interact and the way I can sense my immediate surroundings um, is afforded by how I feel, how I'm uh, somehow configured right here and right now. Uh, now, this view this view foregrounds a a phenomenological. Uh, conceptualization of reality, how we uh, experience a phenomena, right? And emphasize an integrated view of the individual and the scape through subjective experiences. So I want you to uh, keep this in mind as, as, as we, move, um, we move forward. Now, um, maybe it would be interesting to think about linguistic landscapes as sensing the landscape instead of just reading the landscape. And uh, by just I add uh, um, some air quotes. Now, don't be alarmed if you feel a little weird about this whole emphasis on smells and senses, because um, we've been told for a while that uh, uh, the Western thought and culture has really, really emphasized visualism, uh, where some senses are considered uh, inferior. Now, um, as an applied linguist, what theoretical understructure can help me connect to these um, seemingly perhaps disconnected areas in, in meaning making. Well, I turn to translanguaging uh, uh, for this. Translanguaging emerged in the context of uh, Welsh, uh, uh, Wales and Welsh English um, um, bilingual education, Welsh language maintenance programs, um, to refer to a pedagogical practice where input and output were produced in, in two different languages. And uh, more recently, uh, Ophelia Garcia um, referred to translanguaging as the multiple discursive practices in which by Bilinguals engage in order to make sense of the bilingual worlds. Um, it's it's a pedagogy. This is the the it began as a pedagogical sort of approach. Now, uh, when uh, Colin Baker's uh, Baker translated it in two thousand and one, he really emphasised uh, uh, Swain's notion of languaging, uh, which refers to the cognitive process of negotiating and producing meaningful, comprehensible output as part of language learning, as a means to mediate cognition. So uh, th this notion of languaging, which is, by the way, a psycholinguistic uh, notion rather than a, a pedagogical uh, notion, really blurs and blends the idea that language and cognition are two different modules in the mind, this notion of the modularity of mind or language. Um, now, very recently, uh, Lee Wei's uh, very, very powerful proposal of translangu translanguaging as a practical theory of language has helped us uh, push forward through, um, through translanguaging and, and, and really, really engage with it uh, beyond multilingualism. There's no such a thing as language, only continual languaging, an activity of human beings in the world. Language is in the process of being made, right? And uh, uh, languaging is an assemblage of diverse material, biological, semiotic, and cognitive properties and capacities come together, right? Through uh, the languaging that uh, people orchestrate in real time and across different time scales. So we see here that the notion of languaging is not that much at all about using uh, the language or the languages that you know to make meaning, but it's, it's, it's much more all encompassing. Um, it, it, connects to, uh, it connects with uh, the notion of embodiment, right? And how we experience um, meaning making. Um, languaging is not just about words. Human languaging is an activity 
right? And it's, it's, it's very varied and it involves the interactions of different processes on many different timescales. And it includes the neural, the bodily, the situational. It includes social and cultural processes and events, right? So the process of languaging for us translanguaging scholars is much more important than is the, what is languaged. And there I've, I've missed the D at the end, but what is languaged is typically what we refer to as um, um, languages, right? Named languages. We're more interested in the processes wh whereby we uh, <laughs> make me, right? Um, Li Wei's proposal, as I said earlier, is, is, is uh, at the core of my own uh, work. Um, translanguaging, he says, is transformative. It creates a social space for the multilingual language user by bridging together different dimensions of the personal history, experience, and environment, their attitude, belief, and ideology, as well as their cognitive and physical capacity into one coordinated and meaningful performance and making it into a lived experience. Here, Li Wei really emphasizes how this orchestration of our different abilities, not only our ability to talk what we understand as separate languages in, in multilingual practice, but also uh, refers to um, everything that's part of us and that connects, supports, and, and enables us to engage in these uh, uh, languaging practices, right? Now, uh, to advance translanguaging, um, theories and proposals must really, really work to integrate other aspects of meaning making more effectively. And by other aspects, uh, um, my colleague Sylvia and myself uh, refer to besides multilingualism, right? So uh, we can talk about multilingual translanguaging, we can talk about multimodal translanguaging, we can talk about multisensorial translanguaging, and how these are interwoven, not only different layers, but they're interwoven, they're orchestrated, and they, uh, they mutually um, uh, interact with one another, and they're not that easy uh, to tease apart in, 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 in many occasions. Now, towards the notion of sensecapes, which is what I'm really, really emphasizing here and which connects with translanguaging and connects with this, uh, or these limitations in linguistic la landscape research that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I began with two sociolinguistic studies of the linguistic landscape of flea markets in two places. And uh, what I'm gonna be reporting on today comes from these two uh, studies that again, initially looked at linguistic landscape. Now, um, one of uh, the first research site is in the city of El Paso in Texas. It, as you can see, it's, it's not a small city. It's right on the border uh, between um, the United States and, uh, and Mexico, um, at the other side of Ciudad Juarez. And um, there's no official language in the United States, even though English is a majority language. And it's, it's the language that's pushed into the brains of, of, of children who, who come from a minoritized and racialized families and, and, and um, education does its job um, in, in, in the most negative uh, way, uh, re not supporting and removing uh, the uh, opportunities uh, for uh, potentially biliterate children to become biliterate. But that's a completely different uh, story that um, I, can, I can talk about later if you have any questions. So this, uh, this project is, is actually pretty large. And uh, my, my friend and colleague and collaborator, Idoya Lola from Texas Tech University, um, we, we took um, data from four different uh, flea markets uh, Hispanic flea markets around the state of, of, uh, of Texas. So today I'm going to be reporting on, on just uh, some data from, from uh, field work we conducted in El Paso. Um, here are some examples of the, uh, the data that we collected, some photos of the linguistic landscapes, as you see. So there's a, some, some uh, um, Spanish on the one hand, there's some English, there's some translation, there's some multimodality, of course, and uh, there's lots to, to really engage with here in terms of colors, and uh, regrettably, I can't focus on those things today. 
Now, the other research site, the second research site, comes uh, is in the city of Nalor in Morocco. The population is uh, just over 160,000. Um, uh, the languages spoken around Morocco um, are typically Arabic, French, and Tamazic. Um, even though many people speak um, one of these, a combination of these, um, Spanish is also uh, quite common. Uh, the proximity of the city of Melilla, which is uh, literally a border town. It's a Spanish city. It's one of the two Spanish uh, cities uh, on the north coast of Africa. It has an enormous influence on the surrounding Moroccan area. Nador particularly is right there. So it's, it's, it's influenced um, by, uh, by the Spanish and Melillan culture. And of course, Spanish you know, had a protectorate. Um, some parts of Morocco and the very north and very south uh, parts of uh, Morocco for a while with uh, educational programs and so on. So uh, Spanish does have a, um, play, plays a role in, in the local uh, linguistic landscape and linguistic culture, so to speak, linguistic repertoires. Now, these are some examples of the area of the linguistic landscape uh, um, um, units that um, I captured uh, as I went around. And uh, the initial goals, as, as I said, of the studies were to explore the linguistic landscape of the two flea markets in two multilingual, multicultural settings, to investigate the multilingual practices characterizing these two sites and compare them, and to understand the perspectives and experiences of these people, the people who inhabit these spaces regularly. As an outsider myself, going into these spaces, taking photos and, and, and you know, doing a tally of um, how many, how much percentage of English, Spanish, Tamazic, whatever, um, didn't feel like uh, I was actually representing um, a, a local organic perspective. So um, we sought out um, the, the support and the, the perspectives of, of uh, locals. Now, the reasons, sorry, going back, the reason why the point, point three is in red is because that is uh, what suddenly became really, really interesting here. Um, something came up in the interview data obtained in both uh, research sites. La música, los sonidos, the smells, the tastes and flavors, and the touch. So instead of neglecting this type of insight, which appeared in the interviews we had with, uh, with some of the uh, participants, some of the respondents or co-researchers perhaps in this uh, type of research, we decided, I decided to uh, pursue them uh, further. Now, these reports became the focus of this analysis. In the first study, I'm going to be showing you some, uh, feed, some um, um, uh, perspectives, pieces of the perspectives of two focal uh, participants, Antonio and Maria. Uh, both of them uh, were, in the, uh, bo were born and raised in the border uh, space, uh, that is the El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, um, area. Uh, they were both Spanish-English bilinguals. The interviews lasted about 16 and 22 minutes respectively and they were transcribed. Some questions that were used to start uh, sort of guiding the, the interviews were what do you think is the main language of this uh, marketplace, why, what languages are normally used on the signs and billboards around the market and why, and of course these interviews were not conducted in monolingual languages, they were translingual by nature. And Antonio said, sobre todo español, but mostly Spanish and uh, also English, both, um, but here there are many Hispanics. In this market, everybody is Hispanic and some Chinese people uh, also come, Japanese people and so on. And Maria said, mucho español, lots of Spanish. We speak lots of Spanish here, almost pure Spanish and Spanglish, we mix, you know, but um, that is, how things happen here on the border, uh, not only in the market, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez um, are la frontera, the border, right? So I continued by asking, ¿Y qué tipo de letrero? What kind of billboard is the most typical billboard you find here? What type of poster is the most typical you find here? And Maria said, hear the music. Um, don't you see the music? Right over there, the music, the mariachi music, 
from Mexico, the traditional music that we have, that guitar is the most typical thing. More than English, more than Spanish, that is what makes the market. So I, I went on and asked, well, even here in the market, music is important. And Maria said, yeah, can't you hear it? I always have uh, the music uh, playing right over there, pointing at the, at the stall. Um, and over there, that Salvadorian uh, pupusas maker, pupusas are um, um, like a, I don't want to call it a pancake because it's so much more delicious, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Salvadorian um, um, meal. Um, esa es la lengua de acá. That's the language we have here, our Hispanic culture. <coughs> Bless you. So um, music, language, local culture, they're all um, uh, tied up together in this answer to the question question, what's the most typical billboard here? Now, anything else to share about the languages of the market? I asked Antonio and he said, it's the atmosphere really that makes this place. I hadn't ever thought about the languages of the market. I mean, hablamos como hablamos acá. We talk like we talk here. Sabes, you know, mucho Spanglish, you see, pero it's the atmosphere, the people, the noise. You see, you come to the market, you know, there's going to be food, there's music, Right? So I went on and asked, so if we had this interview somewhere else and I asked you about the languages of the market, what would you answer? And he laughed and said, I don't know, Spanish, English, both. The market is what it is because of the smell, the music and the food, not really the languages. You know what I mean? So again, Antonio uh, capitalizes on the senses, right? Similarly, in the second study, which was a, a different type of interview, the, the two previous interviews were conducted um, standing on the same spot, right at the same spot. Maria uh, was at the, um, right by her stall and Antonio was walking around and, and uh, we, we stopped him uh, there. By the way, names have been changed. Um, in this case, I uh, contacted Noor and Camelia two sisters uh, who I know from through a common friend uh, and I asked them to uh, go to take a to take a walk around this um, uh, market place in the city of Nador in Morocco. Um, these two sisters were born and raised in the city of Melilla in Spain um, of um, a Moroccan uh, parents and grandparents. Uh, they spoke Spanish and Tamazic as a heritage uh, language. The interview was a walking interview, probing um, around so that they could point at things, they could explain things, they could take me to the places, and they could really elaborate on things on site. Um, everything was audio recorded and transcribed, and notes were taken off to the interview, adding some personal reflections and making connections with previous data uh, collection stages around Texas with, with my colleague uh, Idoya. Now, the focus of the interview, again, was to gain an understanding of the linguistic landscape through the eyes and experiences of two women who had participated in the market's life since childhood. So this place was a part of uh, their, their upbringing even though it was not in the city where they were born um, I want to really emphasize here that whether it, in, in these um, uh, border spaces um, trans what for the outsider is a transnational movement going across the border for locals there's nothing transnational about it you just live your daily life so it's more of an of a, of a, of a border imposition on what otherwise is a very organic social um, sort of behavior Right. So again, the initial idea was on the um, goal was on the linguistic landscapes. And now um, Noor said, well, here you can see um, there are few um, posters and billboards because the stalls are set up and they're uh, taken apart on the same morning. Uh, these people come with donkeys. Um, they uh, set up um, the prices. Sometimes they don't even do that. They just say them, they call them out. You have to really pay attention. Um, they just yell the prices out. And so you get close, you come over and you touch the fruit to see if it's, if it's, um, if it's good and you smell it and it's all very uh, tactile she said. So here you have a photo of the, uh, one of the actual um, stalls. And Camelia 
um, uh, as we cross, as I said earlier, this, is, uh, this connects with the ver that excerpt I showed you at the very beginning. Um, mis recuerdos de venir aquí, uh, my memories of coming here since I was little, is not that much the language, not that much about the language. It's about the wagons, the, uh, the carritos, the los burros, the donkeys, the smell of the fruit. Um, si, sí, el cherja, Tamazic um, is the is the language, but the market um, is also lived, experienced through trying. Uh, and then she grabs the strawberry and eats it. And then she offered me one. Do you want one? Um, es que hay que probarlas. You have to try them to be able to buy them. Although strawberries here are always good. Uh, this is the most important uh, language in the market. It hasn't changed at all since we were little and we used to come over with my grandpa. Um, as we got to the other side of the road, uh, we saw a, a grocery store and uh, we approached the grocery store. And this is the, the grocery store. We uh, walked into the grocery store and as you can see, uh, there is some linguistic landscape in terms of tags, in terms of uh, uh, prices and so on and so forth. Um, but there is much more than just, and again, just, uh, something to read. As Nua wandered off, I wrote, Camelia and I walked into the store and she continued, Para entender el mercado hay que probarlo todo. If you want to understand the market, you have to try everything and you have to touch it. And she put her hand into a sack of dry lentils. Yo el cherja, Tamazic, the Tamazic language, I didn't speak it very well. And my memories of, of, of here, of this place, uh, the, of when I used to uh, come over and I, when I was little, uh, this is what I used to do, meaning putting my hand in, in, in the lentils and, and the grain sacks. Um, me encantaba meter la mano en los sacos. I used to love putting my hand in the, in the uh, grain sacks and I still do it. Um, don't forget, we're talking about a 36-year-old uh, woman. Esta tienda tiene más años que tú y yo juntos. This shop is older than you and I are combined. The smell of the Moroccan spices, the cumin, the cilantro, the, um, cilantro, the, tea, uh, the tea bar, uh, the cafe um right over there um eso es el paisaje de aquí that's the landscape here más que los más que el cherja more than tamazic more than arabic the smell for me uh the memories que sin los recuerdos esto no sería nada without those memories this would be nothing now as you can see um and let me check out we're okay on time making meaning off and around the market and uh, making sense of it um, is not only done through what we read as typically done in linguistic landscapes research. The smells of spices, the taste of strawberries, the feeling to the touch of dry grain, the sounds of brain of the brain of the, the donkeys. I haven't talked about that, but they also talk about the sounds of the donkeys. Um, how we experience, how they uh, experience the linguistic landscape is also very closely related to memory. Uh, these sensations, these sensorial experiences and this sensorial embodiment, you know, the multiplexity of, 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 of uh, being in, in the linguistic landscape uh, connects with memory, connects with what we know. And uh, there's an interplay between the past and the present, who we are, there's identity work uh, engaged in this, this approach to understanding the linguistic landscape so much deeper and um, uh, out of the scope of just reading the languages around us. And again, let me emphasize, the just is not to menospreciar el trabajo uh, de linguistic landscapes, you know, it's to, to capitalize on new possibilities. Now, in both studies, the participants' explanations of their experiences with the linguistic landscape went beyond the written, the visual representation of languages. The, uh, when they drew on multiple modalities, which were brought into focus to really understand, to really make sense of the linguistic landscape. There's a performativity attached to sensoriality, tasting, feeling, smelling, which in these spaces, is allowed um, in other spaces might not be allowed in other types of markets in other geopolitical contexts these might not be allowed 
So it ties very closely with local ways of being and acting, right? Uh, memories play a role. Um, um, the understanding, the social cognition of things, of, 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 of situations, play a role in binding together different dimensions and excuse the double different over there. Processes of identity and, and identification transcend just the processes of languaging through uh, name languages. And uh, its embodiment is important, right? Considering this, a translanguaging approach to conceptualizing and researching the linguistic landscape expands the boundaries of the traditional linguistic landscape uh, by integrating a variety of cognitive, semiotic, and modal resources, the sensorial, the physiological means to engage with, the, with those resources, and the mental capacities that are called upon to process them such as memory and imagination. And as you can see, this connects very, very sharply with the idea that Li Wei has proposed of translanguaging as a, uh, as a practical theory of language, which uh, goes beyond just the compartmentalization of language and modularity of mind. Um, and it also follows uh, proposals in linguistic landscape research, such as the ones uh, by uh, Osui and Pennycook, um, the one by uh, Shohami, uh, who talks about uh, semi semiotics and semiotic landscapes. So how can we push things forward? The idea of sensecapes for ground sensing in meaning making as individuals experience, as individuals interact and transform their surroundings. This idea overrides Eurocentric hierarchies where vision and textuality are more important than what sometimes is referred to as lower senses, and I'm missing um, commas there. Um, now, Typically, we find, or currently, we see that linguistic landscapes research is perhaps moving towards a more semiotic landscapes conceptualization, as Yanis's work showed earlier on through his work in uh, um, multimodality, and as Corinne's work will show um, after my talk. Now, I argue that the notion of sensecapes, while it doesn't need to be central, to linguistic landscapes. We don't need to debunk linguistic landscapes or rename the entire field. We do need to push this idea of sensing uh, to, to a more central place in linguistic landscape research to really emphasize how individuals subjectively interact, make sense of, and understand um, the, the linguistic landscape or what is typically called the linguistic landscape uh, around them. Now, does this mean that we must never again look at linguistic landscape as publicly displayed words and symbols? Should we now do linguistic landscape research uh, focusing only on the, on the senses? Well, absolutely not. This does not, again, try to debunk uh, the current important work or the history of the field. Um, but I really want to bring to your attention this over-reliance in how the majority reads when defining and an and entire field, right? In this case, linguistic landscapes. And the same applies to the, to the field of, of bilingualism and multilingualism. The, the same applies to the notion of literacy. The same applies to cognitive areas, such as history, cultural studies, anthropology, um, as products of Western tradition, right? There's an Eurocentric perspective and there's colonized uh, thought that's inherent to everything we do, to the, to the uh, shared um, banks uh, of knowledge that we have inherited, right? So I argue for a more inclusive, for a broader paradigm for linguistic landscapes research that includes and engages, and more importantly, that represents all at its core. Thank you very much, everybody. Muito obrigado. Uh, merci and everything else. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Josh. So.